wonderful world of Disney. Prairie and Seal Island. And now your host, Walt Disney. You know, if there's one question everyone seems to ask about our true life adventures, it's how do we manage to pry into the private lives of the animals? Get the secrets of nature on film. Well, here's part of the answer. A telephoto lens that can give you a close-up of an animal a quarter of a mile away. Now, just to give you an idea, down the studio street there, I can see a signpost a couple of blocks away, but I can't read it. But if I pick it up with this telephoto lens, this is what I see. Well, it's this story behind the cameras that we're going to tell you right now. So let's move over to the True Life Adventure Unit and meet James Alger, writer-director of the series. Okay, Jim, carry on. You know, we call our cameramen naturalist photographers because they're experienced naturalists as well as operators of cameras. Some are recognized authorities in their field. For example, one's affiliated with a museum, still another is an ornithologist, and another is a marine biologist. In fact, it takes a variety of talents to film our true life adventure stories. Now, a photographer in the field is something of a trespasser, for nature has a way of guarding her own against the prying eye of the camera. But here, let's take a look at some film on the moviola, and I'll show you what I mean. This is Dick Borden, a specialist on birds in flight. And he's photographed geese and ducks and such from Canada to Texas and from Maine to Oregon. Wherever he goes, Dick always has to overcome the bird's natural fear of humans. And so he set about finding a way to reach their secret hideaways without being conspicuous. To do this, he's rigged up what he calls a sneak boat. This odd contraption is powered by storage batteries. And this electric motor, almost completely noiseless, propels it through the water. Dick, by the way, began his career as a biology major at Harvard, and later was a field worker for the Smithsonian Institute. But now, with all the wires hooked up and the boat ship shape, he's ready for action first loading the all-important camera. This strange craft is guided by his feet, because when Dick's working, both hands are busy with the camera. Once underway, he looks rather like a floating log, and as a matter of fact, that's the whole idea. Here's what the water world of marsh and willow looks like from his water level view. And it's amazing how close Dick gets to his subjects. He's able to record the most intimate details in the domestic lives of the swimmers and divers. He sees the geese taking their young goslings for their first swim. Here he sneaks up on a muskrat so close, he can almost shake hands with him. And then there comes the lucky chance he's been waiting for, the shot he's been after from the start. Here they come, the wild geese in graceful flight. And now he switches to his gunstock camera and slow motion. This camera is fitted with a shoulder rest and can be sighted like a rifle. But to Cleveland Grant and his wife Ruth, it was all in the day's work. These two have devoted a lifetime to animal photography. Working as a team, they go into the remotest backcountry. And it's a matter of film record that what they go after, they get.
Ruth devotes much of her time to recording the acrobatic activities of her photographer husband. Cleve, meanwhile, has his hands full just trying to keep up with the fugitive sheep. And in the end, it takes a good stout length of manila rope and a bit of the cowboy's skill to get where the bighorns are going. If you want a portrait of the bighorn, you must simply follow him to the highest crags. And all the while, Cleve has the double problem of not only getting himself, but also his equipment up to the snow line. But all this effort proved worth the doing. He was one of few humans ever to witness and photograph the strangest of mating rituals, the rutting battle of the bighorn rams. The sound of their collision. we set out to make our feature film, The Vanishing Prairie, we knew that a chapter on the buffalo was a must. After all, he's almost the symbol of the plains. But how to get the buffalo story onto film? Well, that was quite a problem. Still in our research, we'd come across something rather interesting. It was an old trick the Indians used when they hunted buffalo. Now, of course, the red man used this technique for close-up shooting with his bow and arrow. But, we asked ourselves, why wouldn't the same technique work for close-up shooting with a camera, too? For what the idea was worth, we passed it along to another of our cameramen, Tom McHugh. Tom came out of the University of Wisconsin with a degree in zoology and a tremendous interest in nature photography. And though he'd filmed practically everything in the wild, he'd never before had to dress for the part quite like this. A headdress borrowed from an Indian chief an old buffalo robe, and Tom was ready for his foray into the midst of the herd. Now he looked like a buffalo, or hoped he did, because there was always the chance the trick might backfire. And there was a moment when it looked as if Tom might be in for a bad time. But with the crisis past, the rest of the herd was content with a more casual inspection. And Tom was accepted as a full-fledged member of the Buffalo Brotherhood. Indeed, he became so interested in the Buffalo and their ways, he decided to write a thesis on them for his PhD degree at the university. And after all, who's better qualified than a man who's been a buffalo himself. Tom McHugh witnessed events rarely seen in the wild. A buffalo calf's first attempts to walk. And the obvious maternal concern of the cows when the little fellow got into trouble. The longer Tom worked at this, the more he saw. And then it came to him that a whole new chapter of the prairie story was being opened up. Here, right under his nose, was another of the prairie's vanishing species, the prairie dogs. And here was a chance to record the intimate details of their home life. Cousins of the ground squirrel, these little rodents have a dog-like habit of barking. Thus the name, prairie dog. It's a hectic life nature cut out for this species. There's nobody more peace-loving. Such are the dramas, the day-by-day -day wonders, that unfold before the eyes and the lenses of a true-life adventure cameraman. By their very nature, the true-life photographers are outdoor men, and they don't particularly mind working round the seasons. In winter, however, their difficulties are multiplied considerably. Tom 
Tom McHugh joined James Simon, another of our naturalist photographers, and the two of them made a daring excursion into the heart of buffalo country in the dead of winter. They traveled in a snowmobile, a sort of airplane on skis. As a safety measure, two of these odd vehicles were chartered for the trip. In case one got into trouble, the other could serve as a rescue craft. Buffalo were located in their winter quarters. And this time, Tom McHugh found he didn't need a buffalo robe disguise for close-ups. The heavy drifts had the herd slowed down to a walk. This was snowshoe country. But Jim Simon, born and raised in this part of the world, was on his home ground. A former member of the Wyoming Fish and Game Commission and a one-time director of the Jackson Hole Wildlife Park, he knows his animals and where to find them, even in winter. Before long, he trained his camera on one of the most ancient of dramas, the eternal struggle for survival, mountain lion and deer, the hunter and the hunted. Simon joined forces with Lloyd Beebe. This naturalist photographer was also an authority on the life and habits of the mountain lion. You know, nature always deals in the rare and the unexpected. And we've discovered that the problems and habits of real animals are often funnier, more surprising than the antics we dream up for our cartoon characters. I think this is the main reason why all of us here enjoy working on these nature films so much. The members of our True Life staff, by the way, were borrowed from the cartoon productions. Jim Alger, our director writer for instance, once animated and directed our cartoon. And another whom you are about to meet, writer, director, and the voice of the True Life adventures, Winston Hibbler. We're going out on a real true life adventure. And our journey will take us up over the rim of the world to a place called Seal Island. It's such a tiny speck of land, however, we may have a little trouble finding it. Now here's Alaska, here's the chain of Aleutian Islands, the Bering Sea, and Seal Island. A little pile of barren rock almost lost in the fog-bound reaches of the Northern Sea. But it's here behind this curtain of mist that nature plays out a story strange as fantasy yet straight from the realm of fact, the saga of the fur seal. Seal Island, theater for the spectacle, lies ready and waiting for the players to make their annual appearance. The time is early spring. And just where the great seal herds spend the winter months, no one really knows. And yet they always return to these barren shores where each season they reenact the story of their kind and bear their young where they themselves were born. is May, and the play will soon begin. Meanwhile, out on the treeless tundra, the reindeer await the coming of the players. The foxes, too, are year-round residents. All kinds of them. Blues and silvers, and some a sort of compromise. 
Each year, nature dresses her stage with the bright colors of spring. Here in the shadow of the Arctic Circle, the average summer temperature is around 50 degrees, and yet these wildflowers somehow manage to thrive. Lupin, bluebells, poppies, many of the wart family, even the delicate violet. And everywhere, the rocks display a colorful blanket of lichens. The bouquets are in place, the stage is set. Everything is ready for the homecoming seal. And here they are. First on the scene are the bulls. These are the monarchs of the herd. Big, burly fellows, they weigh almost as much as a horse. The seal has often been called the seagoing bear. As a matter of fact, they did have a common ancestor. Following a timeless custom, the bulls arrive at the island a month or so before the females. On these cool, foggy beaches, they'll establish their harems. For the seal is polygamous and may have as many as a hundred wives. These first comers are called beach masters. And for good reason. For a beach master must be big enough and strong enough to hold his home site against all comers. When the beach masters move in, the older residents move out. For the next few weeks, the bulls will have nothing to do but wait for the females. Once the harem is captured, however, the beachmaster must be always on the alert, for protecting his household becomes a full-time job. There won't even be time for meals. The bull goes through the entire summer without eating. He exists solely on the fat stored up in his immense bull neck. Now, for the moment, a temporary truce prevails as the beachmasters doze and wait and watch the sea. Meanwhile, in the gallery seats along the neighboring cliffs, the migrant birds move in to watch the show and set up summer housekeeping. Wild birds by the thousands. Many of them have flown 3,000 miles to nest here. It's the early bird indeed who gets the best spot on these narrow ledges. While this may not seem like the best spot for a nest egg, to the birds, these forbidding rocks are havens of safety. Here's the firstborn helping his brother out of the shell. This handsome matron is Mrs. Kittywake. Mother and babies are doing well. And they're born hungry. Indeed, Mr. Kittywake spends practically all of his time hunting a fish dinner for the family. Other seaside residents are the puffins. There are several varieties. This one is tufted with sideburns that trail in the breeze. and the horned puffin. Brightly colored and gay, this little fellow with the oversized bill is often called the sea parrot. It takes both wing and claw to hold a perch on this crowded ledge, where there's standing room only, and not much of that. Mother Nature must have dipped into the rainbow when she painted the parrot of the sea. Like the seal, these birds come back season after season to the island where they were born. Meanwhile, the vigil of the beach masters goes on and on. Some grow restless and search for better vantage points. 
Others wait patiently through the long twilight hours. But now, over Seal Island, an atmosphere of tension has begun to grow. For with the dawn will come the month of June, and with it, the ladies. Yes, here they are at last, right on schedule swimming and diving playfully as though glad their journey is over. But they don't seem in any great hurry to go ashore. Perhaps they're just playing hard to get, taking their time, looking over the prospects, having a final fling of single blessings. Eventually, however, they must make their choice for better or for worse, so some of them start coming in. Among the welcoming committee, rivalry mounts. Tempers flare as the bulls raise their manly voices to attract the females. The march of the brides continues and competition increases. <laughs> of course, there's always one who just can't make up her mind. The harems are formed by the simple process of rounding up the females and escorting them to the various home sites along the beach. Finally, all the females join the parade to the wedding rocks. There are no old maids on Seal Island. A caress or two, and another bride is added to the harem. Thus, community life in the colony begins. The beach master, well pleased with himself, settles down to watch over his new wives as they take their beauty naps. Sleeping heads gracefully up. What more could one wish? A good home, adoring wives, a peaceful paradise. But sometimes there's trouble in paradise. For every now and then, some fickle female manages to elude the watchful eye of her lord and master. This is what happens when an irate husband discovers one of his wives in a neighbor's harem. Maybe she felt she made a mistake in her choice of master, but that makes no difference. Changing one's mind is not a female's privilege up here. The truce of the first few days is over. Now every bull must consider all the other males his personal enemies. Fights break out constantly. Fierce, jealous rage among the rivals especially if a couple of fighters trespass on another's property. Possession is more than nine points of the law here. Possession is the law. Here's a bull grabbing a wife for himself. He's determined to have a harem, even if there's only one bride in it. He's certainly taking no chances. He has her and he's going to keep her. A curious thing about the seal is its playfulness, its sense of fun, developed beyond that of most wild creatures. In the water, of course, they're as graceful and clever as mermaids. But on land, too, they engage in many forms of play. master, of course, doesn't indulge in such foolishness. It's beneath his dignity. The jealous husband still seems to be having his troubles. He's finding out it's one thing to have a bride and another to hold her. Courtship and battle, birth and growth, and replenishment of the species, going on continually among the many rookeries. Yet out of this seeming chaos, a kind of order grows and the great colony settles down to a comparatively peaceful existence. There are more than 100,000 seal on this one beach. Looks like Coney Island on the 4th of July. Now it's late June, and the rookeries are alive with new babies. 
Seal Island has become a huge nursery. One pup and only one is born to a mother seal each season. This is the pup from the mating of the previous summer. It's born a few days after mother comes ashore and before she mates again. Seal pups are coal black at birth and weigh from eight to 10 pounds. They're nursed like any other mammal. The baby seal gather in groups or pods for comfort, for safety, and for school. Yes, school. Because they learn by practice what they must know as grown-ups in order to survive. Like all small fry, the baby seal imitate what they see and hear. They fight just like their fathers, make all the proper sounds of battle and huff and puff, and of course wear each other out. After the pup is born, the beach master relaxes his discipline and allows mother an occasional day off. As a nursing mother, she must eat well and sometimes has to swim a hundred miles or more out to sea in search of herring and squid and pollock. On these long journeys, her life is in constant danger from her mortal enemies, the killer whale and the shark. Meanwhile, it's Father's Day to look after the kids. And here's one who decided to slip away and see the world on his own, the young explorer. The great adventure is barely underway when he suddenly remembers something he forgot, lunch. Well, there's only one answer to that, mother. What's this? Somebody ahead of him? Wrong mother. A mother seal will nurse only her own pup and she can't be fooled. She always knows her own. So this little fellow will have to keep on looking until he finds the mother he belongs to. Or until she finds him. If she finds him. And there are some mighty big ifs in this world where survival is a daily battle. Or if mother in her search for food has fallen prey to her enemies of the deep, there's real trouble brewing for this youngster. Did we mention trouble? When 800 pounds of blubber parks on your flipper, there's not much you can do about it but yelp. And wait until the big bully makes up his mind to move. It's a hard life, this survival of the fittest. Since no one else will nurse him, let's hope mother comes home soon. For if anything has happened to her, this pup will surely die. There are no orphans on Seal Island. That's a big ocean out there, and this little fellow had better give it a wide berth. For curiously enough, seal pups are born without knowing how to swim. Careful. Whoop. By the way, what's father doing about this? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Now what's this? More trouble? Better look out, one slip here and it's a long, long way down. Ah, here comes mother at last. She seems to sense that there's trouble afoot, and of course her first thought is for her pup. By some mysterious instinct, she'll be able to recognize him among all the thousands of pups on the island. That is, if she can find him.
her father. Hmm. Cool, calm, and collected. Ah, at last, rescued in the nick of time. Whoops. Well, as a babysitter, father was a total loss. Reunion and a happy ending. But best of all, lunch. What a day. In the few short weeks before September, when the seal herd will leave the island, the pups must master the art of swimming. For seal pups must learn to swim like any land animal. And so the swimming lesson becomes one of the most important activities of the summer. In a little tidewater pool, they venture their first dip. Somewhat cautiously at first. But after some trial and error and a ducking or two, they soon learn what their flippers are for. An important part of their schooling is learning to breathe for long submersion. Blowing bubbles in the old swimming hole is all part of their training. Here's a youngster braving the deep on his first practice jump. A very little fellow in a very big, wet world. The males, from two to five years old, are known as bachelors. And bachelors they are indeed. For all the females belong to the beach masters and are members of one harem or another. Free from the burdens of family life, these gay young blades frisk and play at water sports and generally have a good time for themselves. The bachelor's living areas among the rocks and driftwood are usually inland. And this creates a curious situation, for they're completely cut off from the shoreline by the harems of the beach masters. By unwritten law, however, the bachelor is permitted to travel to and from the sea along certain avenues or corridors between the harems. And he's unmolested, so long as he keeps to the straight and narrow. But one bull may have many wives and many bulls none may seem unfair and unjust. But it's nature's way of keeping up the quality of the herd. Only the strongest bull can keep a harem. Only he is fit, according to nature, to propagate the species. And so, living among the bachelors may be found these dethroned monarchs. Once proud beach masters, they've been defeated in bloody combat and have lost their right to rule over a harem. These are the saddest of all failures. Compelled to remain on the sidelines, minus wives, minus family, Minus everything. And so constantly faced with these sad reminders that only the fit may survive, the young bulls spend much of their time training for the one big event of their lives, the day when they can challenge the beach master for a right to a harem. Right now, the youngsters are hardly a match for the veteran bulls. They'll have to wait till they're six years old and fully grown. Meantime, they become one another's sparring partners. They shadow box, lunge and parry, dodge and feint, until they know all the vulnerable spots, the throat, the eyes, and especially the flipper. For a disabled flipper may well turn the tide of battle when the going gets rough. It's rough and tumble and no holes barred through every waking hour as the young bachelor trains for his big day. And that day must inevitably come. Sooner or later, the young bull will tire of single blessedness. Well, on Seal Island, to become a family man, the harem must be taken by force. The youngster must pit his few brief years of training against all the experience and savage fury of a veteran beachmaster. But no matter the odds, the primitive urge for battle cannot be denied. 
Recklessly, he oversteps the bounds, enters forbidden territory. There he goes, the challenger. The Beachmasters growl their warning. Instantly, the whole island is alerted. Here comes the charge. of a dozen battles, the older bull has plenty of experience, but this time youth and speed and power prove too much for it, and he's forced to give ground. The tide of battle turns. Quick to sense the change, the other harem bulls suddenly turn on their former comrade and help the challenger clinch his victory. Driven out by his kind, Battle scarred and bloody, the old beach master seeks the healing waters of the Arctic City. He's had his day and youth must be served. And so, a new beach master. The king is king no more. Long live the king. On Seal Island, the days pass, the swift, hectic summer days. June, July, August. By September, the great fur seal host has completed its birth cycle once more. Again, the herd sets out on its long migration, heading southward into the Pacific, through the Aleutian Passes, beyond Unimac and the island of the Four Mountains, convoying the new generation Swimming no man knows where. Yes, once more the players in the great spectacle vanish into mystery. And Mother Nature rings down her curtain of mist on another true life adventure. The saga of Seal Island.